Welcome, everyone, to another episode. We're here with the man of it all. You have Doug Caputo and Alan Major here, and the person that we get to speak with today, for people who are listening on Spotify and stuff, they're just sitting there like, well, I guess they would already see the name. We have the former CEO and co-founder of Rising Coaches. It's going to be a long title for you. Former <laughs> college basketball coach and current VP of athletics at Renaissance Renaissance search and consulting coach adam gordon coach gordon what's going on hey what's up guys uh, we were just talking about it but i'm not sure your audience is probably tired of hearing from me <laughs> it's great to be back and appreciate the job you guys have done an incredible job kind of taking this platform to the next level so appreciate appreciate you too well, thank you yes, if sir. you can get if you can get everything doug just said on a business card you're a superstar man <laughs> that's uh -huh. right yeah, I, gotta do, I, I always tell everybody, I'll do the bragging for you. Everybody, I know everybody wants to be humble, so I'll. Um, but I, I want to say real quick before we even hop into anything, uh, this is a complete full circle moment because at one point, Adam had me on and was interviewing me. I still have it on my Instagram, and now it's a complete full circle because it's just like, you know, turning the tide. Here we are. Uh, That's what but, it's all about. Yes, sir. So what we'll do is we'll just kind of hop right into things. So I in the introduction, I know um, the introduction that we already pre-recorded, um, it was it talked about all those positions that you had, all the stops that you made, including Tampa, Central Florida, Clemson, and so on, all the way up to Southeast Missouri State, which was your most recent coaching position um, before rising coaches. So what inspired you in the – just first things first, what inspired you and what was your thing that, like, I want to get into coaching and this is the reason why? Yeah, I knew at a pretty early age that I wanted to coach. I would say, um, you know, as early as like, I mean, I just as a kid growing up, I, I just loved basketball and football. Those are my two sports that if I wasn't playing, I was watching it on TV. And mm -hmm. um, I would say probably as early as like 12, you know, I, uh, I had the idea in my head that I wanted to coach. I used to wake up like on Saturday mornings, you know, kids like would put on cartoons Saturday mornings. I would, I grew up in LA and I would put on like the East Coast NBA games, like starting That's at right. 9 a.m. I catch the right. <laughs> just watch all day long uh, and then take breaks and go in the, in the driveway and, and shoot around and then, oh, and then man. come back. So I just, I loved it ever since a young age. And um, as I grew older and realized my dream of playing in the NBA was not uh, going to come to fruition. <laughs> I really was always fascinated with, with the coaching side and the strategy and really motivating yeah. and leading, you know, groups of people. Nice. And then, wow. I mean, ultimately, so you, as I said, your first position started with a um, student assistant position at Tampa and then ultimately came to a Southeast Missouri state and everything in between. But first let's start with how did that position at Tampa come about for maybe those young guys that are listening that are like, this is how, you know, obviously there's not one route, but how did that position come about for you at Tampa? Yeah, I um, I knew that like uh, one route to get into it, if you're not, a, you know, if you don't have the, the luxury of being a player at a high level is to mm -hmm. start as a manager. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I don't know what gave me this idea, but I thought that if I went to a like division two school, I would get more hands-on experience. And so I looked at the top 10 D2s in the country um, my senior year in high school. And it happened to be like South Dakota state was D2 at the time. And like Minnesota, Mankato and all these places <laughs> in the cold and in the Midwest. And, <laughs> right. Oh, that sounds pretty nice. So, uh, I started researching that school. I reached out to the coach, uh, Richard Schmidt, who just retired last year. Mm. Great, great man, mentor of mine. And, um, he was like, yeah, I was going to I was going to try to walk on. You know, I didn't realize how good like a top 10 D2 program was. Um, right. I was like, coach, right. I want to come walk on for you. Um, I didn't even mention the manager part. And he's like, all right, come on when you get to campus, like come by the office. And so I did that. Um, I, you know, I wasn't good enough to make that team. Um, we had a loaded roster at that time um, and uh, went right in. You know, I told Coach Schmidt what I wanted to do. I want to coach and. He said, "Hey, why don't you be a manager?" And that's that's all I needed to hear. And I was I was all in from day one, uh, my freshman year, all four years, and got to take on a ton of responsibilities and and uh, learn a ton with with Coach Schmidt and our assistant coach uh, Mark Olson and Lisa Beamer at the time. One of the only men's mm. basketball 
This is back in uh, 02 to 06. Wow. Back, uh, probably the only female coaching men's basketball. Um, so shout out to Coach Beamer as well. But, yeah, just learned a ton and had a great experience there. Let me ask you this, Adam, Mike. When you were young um, and obviously, you know, seeing the game and playing the game, like I, I can resonate with that because I 13 was kind of the number when I started thinking about coaching. So I know that feeling like when you feel like and you don't know at the time, but you feel like it might be what you want to do. Um, because a lot of people, you never really know till you jump into it. And a lot of people grow up wanting to be doctors and they see their first cadaver. And next thing you know, they're doing real estate. So, you know, you never know. But did someone inspire you as well? Like, was it a was it a high school coach? Was it um, somebody along the way, in addition to your own passion for it? But did somebody kind of inspire and nudge you also to want to get into coaching as well? Um. You know, I had great coaches growing up, but honestly, no, not really. Um, I yeah. really was a fan, you know, just like, like I said, watching NBA games and really gravitated to certain coaches, loved Phil Jackson, read all those books, read mm-hmm. the John Wooden books. You know, I really liked this, the, um, the Jeff Van Gundy Knicks teams um, <laughs> around right. the 2000s. So, yeah, I would say just watching those guys. Um, again, I had great coaches growing up, but. It wasn't yeah. like one that kind of sparked it. I will tell you the the um, the thing that let me knew that this is for sure what I wanted to do. When I was 16, I uh, I started working the Jason Kidd basketball camps. So mm. I had an awesome opportunity. Mm-hmm. My dad knew somebody that knew somebody. Uh, and they were like, can, can you get my son a, a job just as a camp counselor? And uh, so – that was an unbelievable opportunity, and I was really fortunate to link up with some great people through those camps. Mm. And I worked them for like you know four or five straight years. They were run by Coach Major. You'll know this name. They were run by Bill. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, we lost you for a second. Let me chop it up. Okay. Um, yeah. It cut well, out for yeah. a second. Then we lost you at the name. Okay. Yeah. yeah it, I, um, so those, those Phoenix Suns camps were run by Bill Frieder. Um, oh, wow. Coach. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> as good of a coach he was even better at running camps. And you talk about <laughs> being able to like maximize all the dollars you can get from those parents. He was the master. At that. <laughs> so, um, I met some, I really did meet some amazing people, Billy Wynn, um, Gary Tompkins, uh, and rest in peace. And, and Danny Brown, mm. also two guys who were super influential on me um during you know during that phase of my life and and that was really the time where i was like yes this is exactly mm. what i want to do this is the community i want to be a part of yeah because then but now you're getting some hands-on experience actually mm-hmm. doing it then that kind of lit the fire sounds like absolutely yeah good stuff man and starting as a student assistant and then ultimately as i mentioned southeast missouri state was the most recent head or excuse me coaching position you were an associate head coach there uh, and you actually spoke on, there was something I saw, I said, you spoke on being comfortable in your own skin and finding your voice as a young coach. Um, this was on a podcast that you were on. This was a couple of years ago, but can you talk on as a young coach, like you're even at running, working these camps, you know, getting your voice heard as a young guy, but then also just throughout your whole, um, I should just say coaching, uh, career, you know, how, how being able to really find your voice and kind of, how did that work for you? Yeah. Hey, that's life too. That's not just basketball. I think that, For sure. every, you know, being a father, being a husband, being a good friend, like the more comfortable you get in your own skin, Hey, this mm. is who I am. This is what I'm about. You know, the rest follows. Um, no doubt. Yeah. That's, that's something that's really kind of stuck with me, but yeah, when you're young, you know, I probably wasn't very good at this. Like I, I thought, <laughs> you know, I had all the answers and I probably should have listened a little bit more. Um, <laughs> But Join I was the club. afraid to like <laughs> jump in there and, and let my voice be heard and right or wrong. You know, that's just, you know, who I was at the time and what I was about. And and I think that was good because, you know, I, I learned some lessons the hard way. You know, I definitely had some some head coaches tell me to stay in my lane and keep it <laughs> you know, yeah. good for me. You know, I needed right. that at the time. And um, but yeah, I mean, look, when you're coaching you can't pretend to be somebody else. You can't mimic a coach that you admire or a mentor. Yeah. You you got to speak in your own voice. Otherwise, mm-hmm. you know, your message isn't getting delivered. People see right sure. through it and, and you don't come off as authentic. And when you're yeah. not, when 100%. you're not 
communicating authentically. I don't care if you're in a leadership position or not. It doesn't really attract people, you know, right. Nobody really right. wants to listen to that. So, um, you know, that's just something that comes with maturity. And as you get older and experience different things in life. Um, but that, that really was, you know, a big part of my evolution as a coach. Let me ask you this, Adam, would you suggest or agree with the, it's important that coaches continue to grow when they're young of kind of almost developing their own clarity, you know, still learn, pull from everyone that you can pull from that you're around, but also like, continually looking at themselves in the mirror and say, how do I view the game and how do I, what do I believe in? You know, because I think that also helps develop your coaching voice when you have certain convictions about the game and like, and you may not get the opportunity to actually control all that till you become a head coach at some point. But um, it, I, would you agree that it's important for guys to kind of continually look in the mirror and say, Hey, I, I, I've learned this. I've learned that I've learned this. I've learned that. But then, you know, what, what, what is, what does this all look like for me? Because I think that helps your voice as well when you develop some convictions in actually what you believe in. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity, I was a GA at Clemson. Um, mm -hmm. and I was there during the time where they fired, um, coach Bowden and hire and Dabo Sweeney got the interim. Oh, title. wow. Wow. And, you know, Dabo talked about it at his press conference day one. And, you know, we knew all these guys, you know, the basketball office and football office were, were right next door to each other. And uh, we would always play noon ball, the basketball mm. and football staff. So we were close. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, Dabo would talk about this and he talked about it in that first press conference. And it's not that unique, but I know a lot of coaches do this, but he would keep a notebook throughout the years and write down like what he believed in and what yes. he was going to do when he got the opportunity. Right. And, you know, a lot of times when you get that interim title, it's always awkward. It's the middle of the season. <laughs> and you don't know, yeah. like you stick a little bit with what we've been doing or right. do you switch up right away. And I'm telling you, he switched up from the second of the, that first press conference. Like wow. it was, it was like, this is how I'm going to do things. Really appreciative <laughs> of coach Bowden mentor, whatever. This is my program now. And obviously you know, the rest is history and he took advantage of that opportunity, but did he, ever? you know, it just was a great visual example up close and in person of like what being ready really looks like. Yeah. No, I love that, man. Yeah. Cause his deal was mid season, wasn't it? It was, it was like, four, yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. It was like four games in and it was funny because like the, uh, the head, co the head football coach's office um, was right like up against the parking lot. Like when you parked, you'd walk by the outside of the office to get mm -hmm. into the building. And man, those, you could never see in that office. It was always blind shut. Like, <laughs> you know, it was like, you know, walking by tinted windows or something. Right. right. The day Dabo <laughs> got the job, those things were opened up. You could see right in. I mean, it just like visually, just like physically changed the whole. Like it's, you know, it's about to be different. Did was like, yeah. we're switching it up. This is my, my, my deal now. So. Wow, you gotta like that. Definitely a change of culture, I'm sure, around there. Everybody's attitudes, that the the whole atmosphere had to have just completely changed. I mean, did did you see that that affected the players in any way? Just with all of the new changes? Oh, for sure. I mean, they just had a new life about them and some juice, and um, carried it out throughout the season. You know, obviously he they turned it around and and he won yeah. the job, but he didn't mm -hmm. get that without the players buying in and yeah. and uh, them winning a lot of games there. Wow. No, that's great. No, that's, that's awesome great story. And then another thing we want to touch on, as I mentioned, uh, currently the working with Renaissance Search and Consulting. And now for you, I mean, the one thing I guess I'll say in a more of a broad side of things is basketball has so many different avenues, right? You can work in <clears throat> being in athletics in general, not even just basketball, but you could be a coach, you could be an agent, you could be athletic director, you, you, know, you can go any route. Um, for you guys, just talk about Renaissance Search and Consulting. Like, what do you guys do? What are you looking to do? How could I, and I know you mentioned you work with athletic directors, um, but just talk about the services that you offer and to be able to help people out. Yeah, for sure. So we're a search firm. We were established in 2020 uh, by Herb Courtney, who's our, our founder and president. Um, we're one of the only um, black-owned search firms that, that services higher education, 
mm. athletics and, and the corporate vertical. So we work in all those spaces and, and we work with um, employers to help them hire. And most of what we're doing is, you know, I, I work in athletics. I stay in my lane. I don't do the corporate side. <laughs> Andre Johnson yeah. and, and Gigi uh, Ossie on our team handle that. And, and Herb does a great job of going back and forth. But on the athletic side, um, you know, we'll work either with school presidents to help them hire an athletic director or we'll work with an athletic director to help them hire, you know, either a senior staff member, like a deputy athletic director or mm -hmm. a head coach. And we do all sports, um, you know, every, every every sport, you know, from soccer to volleyball. And then obviously basketball is what I know best and, and what I love, love to do. But it, it's been a really cool opportunity to you know, kind of peek behind the curtain and, and be on the other side of it and, and uh, you know, try to help in, in these processes. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that's great. And especially I'm sure there's a lot of coaches out there that could be able to potentially use, you know, use you as an opportunity or I should say, I know you work with more athletic directors, um, but you never know. And then I guess just kind of talking about the hiring process then, since that's, a big part of this, like for coaches, what does a typical typical hiring process look like? If you could just kind of take us through that, like how maybe on average we'll say how long does it take? What are some of the questions, some of the things that pop up throughout that process? Yeah, well, this is kind of cliche, but it really is the truth when it comes to hiring. Like every search process is different mm -hmm. and every athletic director is different. And so they all yep. work on different schedules they all have different priorities and things that they like and are attracted to and things that they don't like. And so, um, you know, that's the first thing is every process is, is completely different and unique. Um, yeah. and you know, I, I guess in terms of like length of time, you know, I know, you know, as an outsider and I was, I used to be like this too, you know, as, or as a fan, even like you want to see like, okay, let's get this thing done. It's not that hard. <laughs> like, right. yeah. Name a head coach. Yep. And <laughs> That's right. actually this like football cycle, you saw a couple of, like hires, you know, turned around really, really quick, which is super really impressive. fast. But yeah. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it takes time. It does take time. And you're trying to um, coordinate a lot of schedules. There's a lot of stakeholders at universities that, you know, play a role in these decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you're trying to get a head coach to meet with the school president. School presidents have a lot on their plate. You know, they can't always right. drop everything and jump on a, a phone call at 3 p.m. today. You know, you right. can try right. to work in the schedule. And, and uh, you know, so that stuff takes time. I would say for, for basketball searches, you know, you usually see them in that 10 to 21 day range. But there's been searches we've been a part of that, you know, go on for, for two months. There's been searches we've been a part of that are five days, you know, start yeah. to finish. So. It really, uh, we can work as fast as the athletic director wants to. Um, it's really on their kind of schedule. This is kind of a two-part question, Adam. Um, do you find, uh, I think I know the answer to this, but I want to ask you to, to make sure. Do you find now more ADs that haven't been coaches before that are maybe using search firms more? Um because they maybe haven't just been in the shoes of a coach and just know, you know, there was a time where a lot of ADs were coaches and they kind of had five or six names in their top desk drawer, <laughs> you know, sure. if they were to lose somebody and they were always kind of ready. Um, uh, and then part two of the question is um, how would you suggest coaches build relationships with search firms? I know that's um, it's always important to kind of be where your feet are and, and, that's a big deal too, but from a, just from a professional development perspective, how can coaches do that? So that's kind of a two part question there. Sure. Um, uh, so the first part, remind me again. Yeah. The first part. Logan. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. So the first part of the question, um, I think you're seeing a trend of like more and more athletic directors using search firms, regardless of their backgrounds. Mm. Um, and even even athletic directors may know who they want to hire. They'll still use a search firm sometimes. And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Number mm -hmm. one, as you can imagine, like if you're an AD and you have an open job, especially like an attractive job like a basketball or a football, you just get blown up. Phone calls, text messages, emails, yes. 
Yeah. Not just from candidates, but from other people, colleagues in the business that are trying to like, hey, put you onto somebody that they know and like or put in that right. Race. And so right. number one, we're able to like offload all of that correspondence and they can just say, hey, you know, we're working with Renaissance Search, like direct all your calls and, and emails right. straight to them. So it yes. clears a ton of space. And and that's critical because when you are going through a search, I mean, there's so much information you have to um, filter through and mm -hmm. you really want that athletic director to like be clear of mind so that they Absolutely. can make the best decision possible. So yeah. removing all of that clutter um, and even like booking the travel, coordinating the schedules, like we take mm -hmm. all that on so that that's off their plate so that they can make the best decision possible. Also, right. if you're like a state institution, you know, um, they have certain laws and, and state rules where, you know, that information, if you're using a school cell phone or email, that's, you know, public, can be public record, public access. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And that's so, right. you know, to protect the process, again, even if you know who you're going to hire from the jump, you yeah. know, if you're at a state institution and you don't want it out there before, because because those rumors kill deals. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no doubt about it. No doubt so, about it. So just to protect the confidentiality of the process, a lot of times ADs will use firms. So yeah, you're seeing it more and more. It used to be mm -hmm. that the only time they would use search firms would be for like a, a football and basketball job. And now you're seeing it for Olympic sports. You're seeing it for assistant AD roles. You know, it's right. really becoming more and more prevalent. Right. In the Administration industry. higher. Yeah. Even presidents are getting, you know, universities using search firm to hire presidents as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's a big two. there's a big practice of like higher ed search firms, you know, for provosts and deans. You know, yeah. that's that's a big area as well that you see firms being used. Um, yeah, the second part of your question, how can coaches? That's the million dollar question, right? How can coaches <laughs> get on the radar or build relationships with firms? Um, I'm really easy to find. You know, having run rising coaches, like my email yeah. is all over the yeah. internet. My cell phone yeah. is all over the internet. <laughs> so, right. I'm really accessible. And like, I try to really like, if somebody reaches out to me, like I'm going to hit them back may not be right away, but I am sure. going to get back to them and, and try to like have a conversation at least. Um, I know like, you know, some of the bigger firms um, that are out there, those people are really, really hard to track mm -hmm. down. And they always say, you know, Hey, when you're in our town, like stop by and yeah, it's yeah. not that easy to get them. Right. Um, right. They may not answer the door. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I do think though, you know, you got to be savvy, you know, you kind of got to get creative and think outside the box and figure out how can I get into the room with these decision makers? And there's events that we all go to, you know, NACTA is one that's like the final four for athletic directors. Right. You know, right. Um, now I, I don't think you could just show up there and work the lobby. <laughs> you know, you have a plan, hey but, everybody. You know, right. part of it is just getting into that room and, and, you know, what I would do and what I tell the advice I tell people is really leverage the administrators at your school. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the people that are in that space that that are connected. You know, yes, your AD knows every search firm person because they're all blowing them up trying to get business. Absolutely. And so if you can build yeah. that relationship on your own campus with those people, uh, that's you know, that's how I would go about building relationships with search firms. Yeah, I love that. It, it, I, quick story. Uh, when I got the Charlotte job, um, we're in Columbus getting ready for the Big Ten tournament. We finished practice, getting ready to come to Indy. I get an email on my phone from an associate AD. I won't name who it was from Charlotte. And they actually reached out to say, hey, congrats on your season. Good luck in your conference tournament. Uh, met you at an event in Vegas last summer. Enjoy meeting you. Um, paragraph two, as you may know, we have a coaching opening here. Wanted to get your opinion on any names of guys we may be interested in. And I'm, I do a 10 scratch moment and I'm going, isn't that your job? <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> yes. So part two of the story is I get home that night. I get a text from that same person saying disregard today's email because our emails are public public uh, accessible to, to the media is obviously mm -hmm. Charlotte being a state school uh, disregard today's email wanted to see if you have interest in our job that's how the whole thing started it was weird but yeah. it was the weirdest email I've ever received what's funny is when I walked into the locker room 
before I picked my phone up, Coach Mata is sitting on the couch in the coach's locker room, and he's just scrolling. And he goes, hey, Alan, uh, the Charlotte job opened up today. You might want to take a look at that one. And literally five seconds later is when I read this email that kind of got the ball rolling. So right. Um, right. just a wild deal of how it happened. But it was because of what you just said. You know, you guys are now really important because you can like I love the way you worded. You can remove the clutter. So, you know, that that email I probably wouldn't receive now today. It probably would have gone, you know, they probably would have reached out to you guys and got some information about me that way but at that time this was 2010 date myself a little bit this was 2010 when that happened yeah it was just a different we were in a different time in terms of searches i think we i think now the firms in the last five to ten years have really it's really accelerated um well as far as being a part of the process yeah absolutely and like you know i did a, a women's soccer search you know, several months ago and I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I'm going on school directories and emailing people, school email and, you know, Hey, can we, can we jump on the phone? Want to talk to you mm-hmm. about an opportunity? Sure. You know, so. That part I haven't changed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And obviously we want to be cognizant of your time too. So we'll, we'll cut to the final segment. Um, just three quick hitters, three quick questions, basically just to get to learn a little bit more about you. If we haven't heard enough with rising coaches and everything, you know, um, we'll get to learn a little bit more, especially from the coaching side of things. And we'll tie it all in with our final question. So for number one, OK, what was the best thing in your whole, we'll say coaching career? What was the best thing you did to help excel it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Was there like one thing that really helped you? Uh, like the best thing that you did to help excel your coaching career? Mm. <clears throat> um, I think I did a, a pretty good job of um, building relationships with everybody on the staffs that I worked with. Um, I was never, you know, I never wanted to be like this one coach's guy. You know, I really tried to yeah, um, yeah. Great advice. befriend everybody on the staff. And I think that really, you know, paid dividends. And uh, and I think when you do that, you got more people connect that are willing to go to bat for you. So 100 yeah. percent, that was big for me. And I did it. You know, it wasn't just like everybody's different, you know. So, um, yeah. you know, when I was at Clemson, we had a staff of Rick Ray, Earl Grant and Mike Winnecki. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like Rick liked to play racquetball. I'd never really played racquetball before. Maybe once or twice, but I learned how to play racquetball. Like I became his racquetball partner. And Earl liked to go for jogs. And so, like, I would go run. I was in great shape at the time, I guess. Earl, <laughs> <laughs> I would go run with Earl because he wanted, like, a running partner. And Mike would go to lunch. Like, he would go out to eat every day at lunch. So I would, like, go to lunch with him. And so yep. I did it, you know, on their terms. But sure, that, yeah. was, uh, that was big for me. Great stuff. And then the second one is, is there one moment that haunts you still? Like maybe a game you lost or a recruit you lost, something. Is there one moment that still you wake up and it's just like, it's there? Oh, man, there's a lot of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. A moment that haunts me. I mean, there's definitely some games that got away that you wish, you know, you, you could have done something different. Um but uh, I, it doesn't. I don't lose sleep over it to this day. No, no. Nope. I guess the the one, you know, just to share a story. I guess uh, <clears throat> my second year at Southeast Missouri, we were pretty we were pretty good, and we had a chance to lock up. I think the two or three seed uh, in the regular season, and our last game was against Austin P at home. Who Austin mm. P was like not that good that year. Um, and so like, and we had just won like three straight, we swept Murray state for the first time in school history. We had a, a lot of momentum and, uh, it was my scout. And so like, um, Rick gave me the kind of autonomy to like work the rotation and put in who, you know, obviously with his approval, but, you know, he really gave us a lot of, uh, leeway with like who was going to be in the game and matchups and things like that. And, uh, and we had a freshman point guard at the time who was really, really good. <coughs> Taj and uh, I probably had too quick of a hook on Taj. I probably should have just let him go out there and do his thing. 
Uh, <laughs> he missed a couple of defensive assignments, you know, just normal freshman stuff. Uh, but he ended up being like, you know, like a, playing in the Pac-12 and he's still playing professionally. Probably should have just wow. left him out there and let him do his thing. <laughs> uh, and we ended up losing that game. It was Dave Luce's last game of his coaching career. And he told him before the mm. game in the locker room, like, hey, hey, boys, this is it for me. This is my last game. So they came out, played super. Oh, inspired. We didn't know that. Wow. And so we're sitting there on the bench like, why aren't our guys like, why are we a step slow? Why aren't we staying in front? And so I was yeah. like, oh, get the freshman out of there. Right. And that's probably the decision that I made. Oh, that I like. That's the one? Regret. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Who would have known though on the other side, like the, the that a you know that bomb got dropped in the locker room and set those guys on fire, you know, exactly. I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Wow. And then the third question would be just personal. How do you measure success as a basketball coach? <clears throat> um, you know, the impact that you have, you know, on, on the people you're around. And obviously your players is a is an obvious example, and you want to see them go on to to become, you know, good people and, and have a family of their own and, and careers and, and be successful, but also just the people, you know, like the staff that you're around every day and the managers and the people in the office, you know, like once you get out of coaching, you don't get to be a part of any, there's nothing like that. You know, there's nothing like that. That's what you miss is like Mm -hmm. those interactions with those people every single day and that camaraderie. And so um, I think your impact on those people, obviously wins and losses, you know, but yeah. greater than that are, are those connections and relationships that you build. Yeah. hundred percent, man. And, and like that, that feeling of everybody, I call it, it's like a collective chase, right? Like everybody in the, in the building, janitors, maintenance included, like everybody is wants you to, you're trying to this this how do we beat this other team by one point tomorrow night yeah. you know <laughs> like but everybody being a part of that and and how they all throw their piece into the pile um and 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 like you said just the the relationships um that you build along the way man you're absolutely right i mean it's hard to beat absolutely and then the final question we have before we get to the closing remarks is <clears throat> What is your top piece of advice for young rising coaches trying to get their foot in the door? And then how can they accomplish that? Um, <clears throat> you got to be willing to put yourself out there. This is a relationship business, right? And so you've got to be able to get yourself in position to be in front of people that, that may influence your career. And mm-hmm. you can't come at them like you're trying to get something from them. You've got to really build a relationship and learn and listen and, and, uh, you know, provide value some way, shape or form. Um, but you don't get to come in and provide value right away. You got to earn that, that trust mm-hmm. and build that relationship first. No um, doubt. And then once you have those relationships and, and you obviously do a great job in your, in your work, you know, I think it's important not to be afraid to ask for help, you know, when you're trying to move up or, or find another job or you let get, get let go and you, and you need to find a job. You know, you got to call. It sucks. I've been there. We've all been there. You coach long enough, you're going to get fired. But, mm-hmm. you know, nobody wants to be like asking for help. But you you have to. You got to call your people and let them know, you know, this is my situation. Or, you know, if you if you know somebody here or, hey, there's this job open. I know you're close with that coach. Can you can you make a call for me? Um, right. Yeah. And so I, I think that, you know, being vulnerable enough to ask for help. And building those relationships, uh, because again, at the end of the day, this is unlike any other profession. Most most professions, you you go online and apply for jobs, and they're going to yep. pick you based on your qualifications. Right. That ain't how coaching works, as you guys know. Yeah. So yeah. Right people. Um, you don't get the degree absolutely. and pop right out into a head coaching position. You you got to find exactly. your own path through it. Exactly right. So, yeah, that would be that would be some of my advice. No, that's. I mean the seed that you guys have planted with this platform, like that's what Doug and I have tried to continue putting out there is just that same thing. You know, don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Like you're always one handshake, one phone call, one relationship away from your life changing. And, you know, you don't always know when that's going to happen or how that's going to be, but um, that's a, that's a big deal that we've continued to try to, to, 
the seeds that we try to plant and hearing everybody's stories that have been on this pod. It's, it's so cool to hear everybody's individual stories because eventually pretty much hundred percent of the time, Doug, like their stories kind of line up with what we're trying to, to promote anyway. Uh, is that, you know, doing whatever it takes and, you know, um, be willing to do whatever you have to do. So um, no, that's great stuff, man. Got to be fearless. Well, and that's why we started Rising Coaches because, you know, I got really lucky with where I worked and the people I worked for, and that helped mm. propel me throughout my career. But not mm -hmm. everybody gets that opportunity. And so we wanted to yeah. bring yeah. people together. So, hey, we can look out for each other. Just because you don't work for this high-profile head coach exactly. doesn't mean you shouldn't have access to other people in the industry. And, and so that's really the whole genesis of Rising Coaches. And I appreciate the job that – that you guys are doing and, and keeping it alive and, and well. And I, I, you know, it's cool to see as I go on social media and see the clips and the podcast and this thing continue to grow. It's uh, it makes me proud. So I appreciate you guys for all the work you're putting in. Oh, yes, thank you. No, man. I, I just want to, yeah. yeah. Thank you for obviously creating this platform. And then again, <laughs> thank you for just teaming up with rich and allowing us to be a part of it. And um, like I said, we just, we want to be the best stewards we can while we're uh, a part of it to uh, try to make it 1% better every single day. Uh, Doug and I talk all the time about how, to, you know, how can we ourselves, he and I get better because if he and I get better then you know, that'll hopefully bleed down into what we're doing. So, uh, but no, it's been a blast, man. It's been a lot of fun. The guests have been amazing to us, uh, just a willingness to, for people to jump on and, and share, um, share their lives and their careers and their journeys. So, uh, but again, we're not here without you. So thank you yeah. first and <laughs> foremost. So, uh, we, uh, we appreciate you, man. Well, I appreciate you guys. It's always great to be back. And, uh, obviously if I can ever help, you know, where to yes, sir. Well, we'll be in Phoenix. Well, we'll, I'm, I'm not, we'll be setting up shop out there, probably doing some live pods and stuff like that out there in, in the, at the final four. So hopefully we can, uh, we'll run into you out there as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Well, thanks for hopping on. Again, Doug Caputo and Alan Major, Adam Gordon, thank you again for hopping on to what, you know, what is ultimately your brand. And, and we're just happy to be able to take over the torch. Um, and of course, that does it for another episode of the Rising Coaches podcast. Keep working and keep rising, coaches. Take care, everybody.